this is your daily briefing and you're most welcome to it. Great to be back. Um, I have to say, almost as great as having not been here for the last few weeks while the World Cup was on. Strange competition. Um, there was no bounce. There was no vibrancy. There was no energy amongst uh, football fans. You meet people in pubs, coffee shops, supermarkets, wherever you talk about football to people in real life, which is where it counts. There was no energy for the whole thing at all. I don't think it was because of any sort of, um, you know, looking down the nose at the death of migrant workers and the money and the sports washing and all the other stuff that people were sort of touching upon. Um, I think it was more down to the fact that it had been shoehorned into the season at the wrong time of the year. And um, people have got other stuff going on in their lives right now. And I just think it was a bad move. I will talk to you at a later date because it's, it's, it's a whole separate thing. That I think football needs to relook at itself. Um, I um, uh, I remain um, uh, someone who would be in favour of something like the European Super League. I think um, once we get past the emotion and the name calling and um, the twisting of the narrative, because those people that were, like I said to you before, that broke into Old Trafford um, and were sniffing coke and and and, and uh, harming stewards and policemen and generally acting like morons, it didn't speak for me. And um, the, the, the way the press went with it was very much, this is the narrative, what you're trying to do here is fundamental. And I think football needs to have a long, hard look at itself. There's lots of football coming. Um, and by that, I mean like the uh, World Club Cup. Um, this is UEFA and FIFA going to war with each other. That tournament's going to expand from, I, think, I don't know what it is, it's from currently seven teams to 48 or 37 or something. So that's kind of attacking the, the Champions League. And I don't think we can carry on with this business of um, talking about players being fatigued and talking about them being injured when they clearly are. And... You know, are clubs going to take the, the, the initiative, take the lead, or are they simply going to become stables um, for horses that need a bit of a rest? But I'm going to do that in a separate thing. But I think that's a huge topic, which we're going to keep coming back to. If it isn't huge, then I won't keep coming back to it. I'm not obsessed, but I just think this bit, the, the traditional formats need, need greater scrutiny. Um but the line I want to take with you today, and I'm going to go straight into this Pedro Porro nonsense, um, is that we need to start, I'm certainly going to do it here, and I don't know if I, I'm going to be able to control myself or these videos are going to have to be marked for 18s only, but we need to start operating with a zero tolerance. There are people discussing mediocre players that aren't good enough to be on most of the Premier League's books, if we're true and honest with ourselves um, and they, 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 they're discussing them in the most uninformed shallow manner possible and you know part of the oomph behind this is the fact that everybody's producing too much content everybody's got to put out 10 articles a day and for my money you're better off doing a little bit of research and putting out two or three pieces a day whatever suits the pace with which you write at um, but the, the absolute just the desire to hit the publish button, it's it, it just kills it just kills me. Um, and no better example than Pedro Porro. Um, I have notes and I take great pleasure in having notes because I'm not a moron who can sit here and dribble out the side of his mouth for an hour and a half. Um, and yes, I edit my tapes. Um, uh, I don't think we're going to have to edit by this stage in the tape. But yeah, I do edit my tapes. I'm proud of that because, again, I'm not a, a, a cabbage. Um, so Pedro Porro, who people have been discussing at length, but I don't think they've been thinking about at length. And it goes back to this thing, like I say to you, where's the research? Where's the evidence-based fact? Opposed to, do you think we're going to sign? What do you know about this guy? Have you done any work? No, you haven't. So Pedro Porro could be on his way to Tottenham Hotspur. And um, the first thing I'm going to throw you a curveball here is the background to the situation of the guy um, at Sporting. And that's something that nobody's bothered to include here. That Porro's was, Porro, I keep on pronouncing his name wrong, Porro was brought in to relieve the burden from the existing 29-year-old that's on Sporting's books called Res Ricardo Escaris. Okay. 
And this guy, or Iscario, it's uh, it's Portuguese, and I'm not Portuguese, my apologies. Um, and the problems with Pedro Porro are very straightforward in a fair. And if, any, if there were any gatekeepers to Spurs transfer rumours, then, um, you know, if they existed, then none of this stuff would have ever got through and have been denied access. Um, local paper over there, uh, Correro de Mana, um, said that Marcus Edwards is operating on Spurs' behalf to encourage Pedro Porro to join us the perfect storm of stupidity uh, and this presupposes that um, um, Edwards does indeed have a soft spot for Tottenham Hotspur which all I can tell you is and this is my product I don't know I don't know just because he used to play for us and was bundled out the building does that really put the club in a great light with him it wouldn't have been my first guess I have to tell you um so there's the business that you know the the, the club are interested. Um, that and I've got to say this is the thing. This is the killer. Where did this come from? Where did the Pedro Porro King thing come from? And again, I'm boring. I'm not just shouting. I wonder if we should sign him. It looks really groovy. Not because and people are just bored with Emerson Royale. People are bored with this, that, and the other. Oh yeah, buy someone. Yeah, yeah, buy someone. I'll queue up all day for that. Yeah, buy someone. The reality is that Porro came i think he was sprung catapulted into um our um you know people's consciousnesses by jermaine genus when we played them and there was a line when he was on uh, doing a, a tv commentary and he said if i had to pick a player then it would be poro he's had a great game now there's a raft of difference between that being an endorsement from anybody to do with the club which i would struggle to believe it genius has any insight there um called me old-fashioned um a commentator with a throwaway line and then the press with nothing to do whatsoever and the thing snowballs and if you think i'm being miserable that's how it works kids that's how it works um and, and i gotta tell you the days the days of people mumbling stuff to um, journalists, as if they sort of both stood there smoking roll-ups in the training ground. Yeah, I'm here in, uh, you know, we've been uh, absolute cobblers these days. And it, it was certainly the case under a few managers um, at Tottenham. Um, and, and, under, <laughs> under Harry Redknapp, it was difficult not to find out what Daniel Levy had had for lunch. Um, but things have got tighter and tighter and tighter. And that's why 90% which is a very big equation, right? 90% um, of the information that's coming out, as I'm hearing, is garbage. So anyway, let's try and keep this in some sort of order. So anyway, we've got the business with Marcus Edwards, supposedly encouraging. We've got Jermaine Gina saying, oh, if I had to pick a player. And um, we look at we look at this. Uh, oh, yeah, Ojo, Ojo, Ojogo, um, which is a, a Portuguese outlet says that Sporting have set an asking price of £35 million in order to sell Porro this um, January. And the reason they've done that is that they want to make a nice big profit um, on the fact that it would inconvenience them enormously. And like I said to you before, they've got a player there. If you look at his uh, numbers, he's been playing um, a decreasing number of numbers. Porro has been coming and playing an increasing um, number of games. And um, it wouldn't make any sense for them. They'd have to go to the market straight away. And they would need compensation in order to be interested in doing that. Um, so where did Porro come from? Because, you know, I, I keep asking questions. Situation, a club doesn't look right. Um, we're then sellotaping together um, the, the Marcus Edwards connection. We're sellotaping onto that, the Jermaine Genus thing. But I'm just trying to get to some facts here, you know, because I don't know. And I, that's why I did a little bit of research. And it doesn't kill you. We've all got computers. So Porro joined Manchester City, hello, back in tw the 8th of the 8th in 2019 from Girona for chump change just 12 million euro uh, that was three years ago that was pre-pandemic if my maths is right um, didn't work loaned to Valladolid um, if I've mispronounced that incorrectly um, then to Sporting a few seasons down the line and the 23 year old was finally sold to Sporting for 25 million euro and that included any add-ons um, 
Fabrizio Romano um, raised um, to our attention, drew to our attention, that there were complications. Um, and this again is about the fact that uh, Manchester United have got a kick, Manchester United, Manchester City even, have got a kickback involved in the, their contract, as we have with Marcus Edwards. Um, so beyond Sporting's personal right wing back situation, where the, by the lad is the future, opposed to just the past and you know, maybe the current, um, and beyond the Manchester City aspect, like, would they be willing to direct the player in our direction or not? Um, beyond these two potentially unfathomable no-go zones lies the quality of the player himself. And one swallow doesn't make a summer, and one um, favourable remark from Jermaine Genus is a very thin endorsement. Um, so look at the graphic here. I've tried to make it as clear as possible. And if you compare these two players, and that's Porro and Emerson Royer, who everybody hates, but like I've said to you before, I don't have a massive ache on Royal because I did my homework, some of you have as well. In fact, most of you watching this have done your homework, generally speaking. So f forgive me if you feel I'm patronising all of you. Um, but the bulk of these idiots that are reporting this stuff are doing it in such a superficial manner that this uh, non-story, has suddenly has currency and I can't believe any scout worth their while and all my numbers there are taken from the scouting one of the scouting tools that um, professional clubs and agents use so you know if you don't like what you're looking at that's not my fault I've only brought you the professional stuff that's on the market that isn't free that you the stuff you have to pay for and you can see that Porro is in the main indistinguishable from Emerson Royale. And if you're going to say, oh yeah, but um, the usual thing I've I've used before about, yeah, but if he plays for Spurs and he plays for Antonio Conte, stick a cigar in his mouth and a Spurs shirt on his back and we've got a winner. That is the voice of a child. Now, do you really think like that? I hope if you do, you leave me a shitty little comment and go away because this isn't for you. This isn't the children's section, okay? This is where we actually look at stuff and try to, we, you know, wade our way through the guano to get to stuff that's actually worth discussing. Um, so Poro, for me, is the poster boy of um, internet stupidity. And I wouldn't give it house room. Yeah, sure, don't get me wrong, because that's my product. I don't know. We could sign him. Um, we could waste 35 million euro on this guy who isn't pulling up trees um, in the Portuguese league, um, who isn't um, a super duper proven high functioning footballer. He's not an elite footballer. Um, yeah, we could do that. Um, but I'm just putting the information in front of you. This wouldn't be making any great advancement on Emerson Royal, Matt Doherty, or the next guy through the door. And the burden of um, responsibility on all this is on Daniel Levy. You sold Kyle Walker, I don't know how many years ago, for 50 million quid, and the hole in the boat remains there, but you've spent the wrong end of 100 million trying to shore up where the water is coming in. So uh, I'm back. Another cheery contribution to your uh, Tottenham Hotspur discussion. Um, these will be coming at you thick and fast now because the rumours are going to be kicking in. All the players, all the boys are back in the barracks. And um, But as I say, don't come here for, oh yeah, I think we're going to, because we're going to look at stuff. We're going to see if it fits. We're going to do a little bit of research. OK, this isn't university challenge. We will have a laugh. But we're not just going to be peddling stuff mindlessly. Zero tolerance on all of that. Not interested. That's it for now. Good luck. Keep it on them.